We have a very talented roster. We have a very talented team. But the reason we have a chance to be great is we're really good at grinding. I always think the best CEOs are grinders. Yeah. Yes, you have to have a vision. Yes, you got to set a culture. But the best ones are, it's not about them. It's the grinding. Grinding. It's a concept that resonates in the blue collar town of Philadelphia, a city that loves its football team. They'll even spell it out for you. I think Philadelphians are just eager for any type of joy that we can get. I will say that our level of booing, chef's kiss, best in the world. While Eagles fans are infamous, the team's owner, Jeffrey Lurie, may at first glance seem like the polar opposite to the Philly faithful. A PhD-wielding Hollywood film producer who grew up in Boston? That's not what many have deemed a Philly guy. And in his time, he has made some unpopular decisions. The Philadelphia Eagles select Jalen Hurts. What? What the f***? <laughs> we're not risk-averse. And we never want to be risk averse, whether it's on the football field or off. And that allows you to have this culture that can achieve some successes continuously. Uh, he's not your typical owner. And so he's not going to think or operate like all the other owners. In his nearly 30 years with the team, he's gone from being the youngest owner in the league to a standard bearer of what modern NFL ownership looks like. We're stewards of something incredibly popular. Let's run it well, but at the same time, let's really make a big difference in, in the communities and across the country and maximize our, our love for each other. Just off Broad Street in South Philadelphia sits the Eagles Novacare Complex. I'm here today to meet with their owner, Jeffrey Lurie. Now, if you're outside of Philadelphia, you might not know his name. And that's not an accident or an oversight. Lurie hasn't been one to sit down for long interviews in the past, but I wanted to understand how he views himself, his businesses, and the future of running a pro football team. You know, as I was thinking about you and, and preparing for this, it, it struck me this is not a franchise that has these massive highs and, and then like stunning lows, as it were. There's a consistency to it. How do you create both a culture and an organization that is able to sustain? So not easy. And I think what we were able to do early on is establish that culture. That culture is very intense, hardworking, blue collar culture within an organization that's very focused on the key things that drive success. Jeffrey Lurie has owned the Eagles since 1994. It's an investment that you'd have to say has paid off for him. He bought the team for just under $200 million, and estimates today put the team at $4.9 billion. One of the things that I've found to be true in pro football, probably to a greater degree than the average fan realizes, is that ownership really has an effect on the team. If you have a good owner, then you have a real chance to win. If you have a bad owner, uh, it just poisons the whole organization. NFL ownership styles vary around the league, to say the least. Maybe best illustrated by the owners within the Eagles' own division. The New York football giants have been owned by the Mara family and their offspring for nearly 100 years. It's a family business passed down through generations. Down in D.C., the newly renamed Washington Commanders are for the moment owned by Dan Snyder. Snyder is, to say the least, unpopular. And his tenure has been plagued by accusations of personal and financial misconduct, leading to federal investigations and calls even from fellow owners to sell the team, which he may finally do. Then in Dallas, you have Jerry Jones. I hope there's some cowboy fans here. Maybe the most recognizable sports owner on the planet, he has successfully marketed the Cowboys into being the most valuable sporting franchise ever. The team was valued by Sportico at a staggering $7.6 billion in 2022. There are all sorts of different owners. I mean, some owners like the visibility. Some owners get into this because they love the visibility. After games, 
he stands in the middle of the locker room and people go to him before they go to the coaches and players in some cases. And he loves that. And Jeffrey is on the other side of that. If I'm tuning in to, to sports radio, you know, you're not doing a, a, a WIP call-in show. No. You are, I mean, this in and of itself is pretty rare for you to sit down and, and have an extended conversation. Right. Is that your personality? Is it a business choice? Like why, why sort of take that approach? So, you know, for me, it's not wanting to, it's much more wanting to embrace the fans directly, not through gatekeepers. So I always saw sports talk radio as interesting, valuable to, um, you know, for fans, but it's a very different business. We're in the business of trying to win big, have a great organization, represent the community in a great way. We're not into wanting to monetize drama. That's in stark contrast to Jerry Jones, whose strategy has meant repeatedly placing and finding himself at the center of every conversation and controversy tied to his team, whether he means to or not. Financially, it's worked out, despite the team only winning three playoff games in the last 25 years. Lurie's far more reserved approach puts him in a more familiar setting, behind the camera. And local residents, they're more than happy for the spotlight. I think the fans are the star of the show. My name is Amir Questlove Thompson. I am a musician, member of The Roots, a director, and a proud Philadelphian. Quick time out here. Questlove? We're going to get more into this later, but beyond being a Philadelphia native, six-time Grammy Award-winning musician, author, and podcaster, he's also a film director. He won his first Oscar for his first movie, a film called Summer of Soul, which Jeffrey Lurie executive produced in his other business, documentary filmmaking. But for now, let's get back to those Eagles fans. Even though it's a cosmopolitan city, it's really a blue collar town. It, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's, it's a blue collar town in, in, the, in the drape of a cosmopolitan city. We're elegant, but we also might have a pack of batteries uh, inside the inside pockets. <laughs> said winning the Super Bowl meant the world to me. And the first thing I did after we won the Super Bowl was get this Eagles lip tattoo. Whether it's lip tattoos with the score of Super Bowl 52, getting arrested. Go Eagles. Or whatever this is. It's a passionate fan base that is gonna let you know how they feel, even while rescuing children from fires. Oh, my man just started throwing babies out the window. We was catching them, unlike Aguilar. Local news stars aside, with such a vocal fan base, Lurie has often gone against popular wisdom. With the uh, second pick, the Philadelphia Eagles select Donovan McNabb, quarterback, Syracuse University. And while some decisions like taking quarterback Donovan McNabb over running back Ricky Williams worked out, others, not so much. The Philadelphia Eagles select Jalen Rager. I've never wanted to make popular decisions. I kind of grew up in Boston with a baseball team at the time that always kind of made popular decisions and they always kind of ended up not doing very well. And I always thought, you know, if I ever had the chance to run or own a team, don't ever try to make popular decisions. Try to make what you think is best. If we're gonna have to change a coach, it's gonna be changed for a great reason for a coach that can provide, provide something that's been missing. If it's a, a player mistake, don't continue to make that investment in that player mistake, but move on. Have a sort of a self-critical nature about it. That's part of the culture. Um, I think that's been one of our keys to success is we, we pay very little attention to the outside noise and recognize some of it is true, some of it's not true, and the best thing you can do is do what you think is right. And recently for NFL owners, doing the right thing goes beyond the football field. NFL team facilities tend to be shrines to the players and personalities of the team's past. But right as you enter, you'll notice something a little different about the NovaCare complex. A wall of heroes honoring Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, and Dr. Paul Farmer. This is not the typical entrance to a, a to a football facility. Very early on, after owning the team, I thought, you know, the values we really want to present 
to our players, our employees, our, everybody involved in it is, football is incredible. It's the most popular sport in America, but let the values be even bigger. We're out there, we're out there to have a great practice. You know, we're singularly focused on the next play, the next practice, the next game, and yet our lives, we're human beings, and this is a chance to kind of put it all in perspective, and it doesn't take away from being hyper-competitive. It makes you want to make a difference, whether it's on the football field or off. I, I think it ups your odds on, on winning. While over Lurie's tenure, the Eagles have taken up a number of causes all around the Philadelphia area, more recently, Lurie's focused his philanthropic efforts closer to home on autism research. Thank you all for being here today and for your unwavering commitment to helping improve the lives of those impacted by autism. You know, I, I hesitated for a long time integrating my wanting to try to make an impact in the world of autism because of my brother um, and the family business, so to speak. Um, it became something where I wasn't needing to like push it aside, but saying, you know what? We could be a sports team that absolutely identifies with a underfunded condition that affects millions around the world and kind of make it so that there's no real difference between the Eagles and autism. As you notice at the end of every end zone, um, we have Eagles Autism Foundation. So every time there's a TV shot of a score, a field goal, whatever's going on, the Eagles and autism are synonymous. That was my goal because that allows us to reach millions of people. It allows us to have terrific fundraising. It's amazing to see our, our players and everybody want to be part of it. Philanthropy across the entire NFL is also changing, spurred by a workforce, the players, who have louder voices and higher expectations. Today's NFL occupies a unique and important place in American culture, reflecting often in stark terms the biggest opportunities and challenges. Great wealth and individual success right alongside a history that includes systematic racism, sexism, and abuse of power. The past several years have seen NFL players fight for voting rights, equality, and more by leveraging their fame and influence. Do you feel the expectations have been raised for, for ownership during, the, during your tenure as an owner? I do, I do, in a good way. I think we're really challenged to be good, really good community examples, and let's not just be, we're the NFL, we're so successful, we dominate television, our valuations are gigantic. Let's absolutely be the best citizens we can be, and let's judge ourselves not just on the field, but off the field. Lurie's also leaned into the interest of his players when it comes to social issues, most notably in the recent past with Malcolm Jenkins. Are you not going to say anything today or just going to use these posters? I cherish having, you know, players like Malcolm. I encourage players to be really community involved. I always really enjoyed his ability to think through what he wanted to accomplish and then set a series of short-term mechanisms to do it. We are here to use um, our leverage, our voices, to make sure that our families, our communities, um, our kids are a priority. Continuing this legacy of using the NFL as a platform for change, quarterback Jalen Hurts has been raising awareness around gun violence, all with the support and amplification of the Eagles. I think the, the more important thing is the platform we have um, and the opportunity we have to amp impact the people around us. Um, there, there's definitely an intersection between sports, entertainment, and popular culture. It's up to us, the leaders in those industries, to be able to celebrate the beauty that we have and attack the, the problems that we have, because there's real problems of poverty, right. inequality, uh, social injustice, these are real. Yet at the same time, let's celebrate um, the, the wonderful people that we have. Lurie's own off-field platform, Making Movies, allows him another avenue to advance important conversations. His films document seminal, but often little known moments in American history, Stories that give voice to our collective, complicated relationship with race and equality. And the winner is Summer of Soul, when the revolution could not be televised. Amir Thompson. 
and four white guys. So here's the funny thing. So the normal protocol, especially with documentaries, is you usually just have like one benefactor, like one one producer, one person to finance it. This film was very unusual in the fact that everyone sort of want, wanted in on the action. And when I saw the name uh, Jeff Laurie, I was like, nah, it's not him. Anyway, and went on and I saw the name again. And I was like, wait, isn't this the guy that owns the Eagles? And they're like, yeah. I was like, wait, he's in the movie business? Who knew? Like, I, I had zero clue. The movie industry was the family business for Jeffrey Lurie. His grandfather, Philip Smith, was an entrepreneur in the movie theater business. He helped popularize the drive-in and the suburban shopping mall theater. It's interesting when you parallel and look at, you know, what I'm doing now, but it was all focused on making the enjoyment of watching, like the fan of movies, enjoy their experience. So big, beautiful screens, clean bathrooms, easy parking. This was his way in to try to get people to appreciate storytelling. Lurie has produced some narrative films over the years, but of late, documentary has been the effort of his company, Play Action Pictures. Lurie received his third Oscar for Summer of Soul. It got presented to us as this is a project, would you like to help from the very beginning with Quest Love? And we've got access to the archives of all this music, and we just thought it was a perfect project for us. And often we will take stories that happen, history that happened that has a very, very real present day um, relevance. Like I've seen rubber stamping in the industry, especially with the executive producers. You know, talk to my people, they'll explain and I'll do the final signature. Yep, it's good to go. Jeff is really, really passionate about movies. And, you know, he had notes uh, for every rough draft that we sent. You know, we did at least five cuts of Summer of Soul. His notes were front and center. Built around never seen footage of the 1969 Harlem Cultural Festival, Summer of Soul ultimately tells a story not just of an amazing lineup of artists, but of what their hidden history says about America then and now. It started out just as a cool mixtape of performances, and then it wound up really being a, a life lesson. It was one where I, I love showing it to our players. Yeah. Um, they were, in most cases, like, shocked at the the late 60s and what was going on both in the country and the, the humanity of it. So a lot of the parallels here of, of owning a team, uh, having a documentary film company, is to explore the humanity and elevate the value of human beings that really need to be elevated as an example in society for all of us. And it strikes me that that outlook, philosophy, ethos, however you want to describe it, you know, comes into sharp relief in the summer of 2020. Protests over the death of George Floyd while in police custody now in their eighth night. The remarkable scenes that have been unfolding in cities across this country yet again. There's a lot of your work that starts to come to a very fine point at that moment. Your worlds are colliding to, to some extent in terms of what you've done as a filmmaker and what you're doing as the owner of this franchise. Take me back to, to that summer. So, obviously, very difficult summer, but not atypical. Um, there's a lot of um, taking down of black citizens uh, all across the country every, every day, every week. But, you know, a terribly polarized time in America and a lot of anger coming out. Suddenly, the very issues that were, we were dealing with in 1969, we were also dealing with those same exact issues 50 years later. I, I will say that this entire decade from 2020 on will be sort of a, a new establishment and a new uh, beginning for the platform and who gets to speak on that platform. While Lurie continues to work with players and filmmakers in areas of representation, 
On the football field, the Eagles have also played a key role in elevating black players to the most coveted role in the game, the quarterback position. Entering the 2022 season, the Eagles had the most games started by a black quarterback in the history of the NFL, with 360. In comparison, their rival, the New York Giants, had only one, ever. You know, first of all, we're trying to get the best possible quarterback. Um, so it's not in any way, well, oh, okay, this person is, uh, is black or whatever. That, that's never been the case. We always want to get the best player. On the other hand, whatever um, I'm involved in, I think there's a feeling of sort of undervalued. Certainly felt that with Donovan McNabb. Nobody had ever drafted a, a black quarterback that high in the history of the NFL at the time, number two. We were lucky to get him. I mean, we were so lucky that the team who had the first pick undervalued him. His mobility and his ability to be dynamic on the field were probably undervalued by that team. And, and goes on and on. With Michael Vick, it was more, this man deserves a second chance. The, the things he got involved in were awful. You know, I described him as, as heinous uh, with dogs. And I'm a dog lover, but we felt in America at that time and, and still to today, Often black people don't get second chances. And this was a man who was very talented, that's why he was getting a second chance, but also because we believed his desire to make good on some of the you know, things that he caused a lot of pain uh, were real. And, and Michael proved us to be right for giving him the second chance. So there's a, there's a history to, to Randall, to Donovan, we had Rodney Pete, I could add Jalen Hurts to that. Um, just, just all excellent people, comes down to it. Um, excellent people who probably were undervalued. And so whether it's black musicians in the 60s or quarterbacks in the you know, 90s and 2000s, um, there's a similarity. So I feel like we've been like leading up to, to a moment where I ask you sort of one of these big sweeping questions. Sure. What's your advice as the, as the future of the NFL unfolds for someone who is coming into this now? Well, first of all, come into it if you love the sport. Don't come into it like you're just running a business. It's not the same. Number two, manage your team to the best of your ability and not what outside world influences, those are short-term influences. Don't pay attention to that stuff. Don't try to be popular. That's That'll create unpopularity, basically in the long run. Lori's giving that kind of advice in real time to his son, Julian, who has worked for the NFL and recently joined the Eagles full-time in a business and football operations strategy role. Lori Sr., having grown up in another family business, has turned the Eagles into his own and plans to pass it down with an expectation that his children will run it with the same attention. But it feels like 30, 40 years ago, you could sort of be a gentleman owner, right? You could just sort of like yeah, rock I'm up sure to the stadium could. on Sundays. I'm sure but you today, could. today, no way. No, and you won't be successful. You gotta be really passionate and feel that weekly ultra competitive nature. Right. And it's also what makes it great. Yeah. I love that competitive juices. You're not manufacturing uh, widgets, you are, trying to maximize human beings. Even better than the movies? Even better than the movies. <laughs> Even much better than the movies. Yeah. <laughs>